welcome to Tabletop Skirmish Games. I'm Lee, and in this video, we'll be going through about how to play a Warcry campaign series. Every warband that sets foot upon the blood-soaked lands of the Eight Points has their own ambitions and motives. Narrative play looks to explore the stories of each warband and bring them to life on the battlefield. Although it's fun to play one-off battles of Warcry, for many players the real challenge of the game is to play through a campaign. In a campaign, you chart the progress of your warband across the wastes of the eight points towards the Varen Spire, linking each of your battles into an ongoing narrative that tells the story of your warband's rise to glory as you strive to complete your campaign quest. Along the way, some of your fighters may die, after all, life is harsh and unforgiving in the Eight Points, but those who survive will grow in power as they carve out a bloody legend for themselves and your warband. This video series will detail how to play through a Warcry campaign and will break it down from start to finish covering everything you need to know. We'll use the core book, the catacombs book and the supplement books to look through all the different campaign quests that are available to you. Let's start with embarking upon a campaign. To play through a campaign, you will first need to choose a campaign quest and fill out a warband roster for your warband. Once you have done so, you are ready to challenge any opponent to a campaign battle. In Warcry, the campaign quest you choose for your warband is unique to you and charts the progress of your warband only. This means you can challenge any opponent to a campaign battle so long as they too have chosen a campaign quest and filled out a warband roster. Some players may be part of a group of players that decide to all embark upon a Warcry campaign at the same time and to only challenge those within their group to campaign battles. Other players might play a different opponent each week at their local club or game store. There's no right or wrong way to play through your campaign and the rules presented here are flexible to cater to the needs of the individual player. Many people like to play Warcry solo and when it's difficult to meet up with other people to play, playing solo is the only way that we can get our games in and it is certainly possible for us to play a campaign on our own. When choosing a warband to battle against in solo play, just make sure that that warband meets all the requirements of any warband that would play in a campaign. For example, make sure the warband roster contains the correct number of fighters and the correct number of points and make sure that those points reflect the different stages of battle. If, for example, you're playing at 1300 points, then it would be probably too easy to pitch yourself against a warband who have only got a thousand points. So try and even it up so that both warbands have equal chance of winning the battles. With solo play becoming more and more popular, I'll make sure to include one video in this series that is dedicated to solo play and we'll talk about all the things we can do to make a campaign work really well while playing on our own. Before we get to that video, I'll make sure we've gone through all the rules that you need to know to play a narrative campaign. And then once you know those rules, it'll be really easy to play it solo. It'll also make it a lot easier to go through once we know all the rules. Now let's look at campaign quests. At the heart of every Warcry campaign is the quest your warband is striving to achieve. This is referred to as a campaign quest. You can find a whole array of different campaign quests to choose from in the campaign section of the core rulebook, but also in the supplement books that come with Warcry. Each campaign quest has one or more faction rune marks to denote which warbands can embark upon it. The campaign quests in the campaign section have a single faction rune mark, and so choosing a campaign quest often goes hand in hand with choosing which warband you wish to play through the campaign with. In addition, each campaign quest 
contains the following. Number one, the territory rules. Each campaign quest has its own territory rules that enable your warband to dominate areas within the eight points. For the aspiring followers of the Dark Gods, these territory rules allow your warband to raise sinister monoliths and enslave chaotic beasts as thralls. For other warbands, such as the Stormcast Eternals, the territory rules will allow your warband to purge the chaotic taint from the lands and create areas of hallowed ground. The territory rules for each campaign quest are detailed in full upon it. Number two, artifacts of power and command trait tables. Each campaign quest has one table of artifacts of power and one table of command traits. As your warband progresses, you will be awarded items from these lists at certain points. This is explained in the aftermath sequence and we'll go through this in a video later on in the series. Now let's take a look at the campaign section and have a look at the campaign quests and we'll use the Beasts of Chaos as our example and we'll go through all the different options for them in the core book but also in the supplement books. Choose one campaign quest and read through it in detail to give you a good overview of the layout of the campaign quest, what it contains and then once we've understood that we can move on to part two of the video where we muster our warband. So here we've got the core book and starting on page 80 this is the campaign section and this is to be used alongside all the rules we're going to cover in the series and this section contains all the resources you need to embark upon your warband's quest for glory and power and on the following pages you're going to find campaign quests for every faction playable in Warcry so whatever allegiance you choose you will brave the deadly wilds of the eight points and make war upon your rivals gaining unique skills and artifacts as you spread your influence across the land. As you progress upon your individual story path, you'll come to several critical junctures, each with an exciting accompanying narrative. Each campaign quest culminates in a thrilling final battle. Should you triumph, you will earn a mighty reward and perhaps even gain the favor of the ever chosen himself. This section is gonna give us all the campaign quests but in this core book, it mostly focuses on the original Warcry warbands. So you can see here, we've got the faction rune mark for the various warbands. And this one here is for the Iron Golem. And you can see they're going to get one, two. They're going to get two campaign quests. Then we've got the Untamed Beasts and so on. So each warband is going to get two campaign quests that can be played from this book. And so let's keep flicking through so you can see all the different ones. And then it's also going to give you some for the Scions of the Flame. You're going to get some for the different warbands here. The Night Haunt, Stormcast, Legions, Gloomspike Gits. But it doesn't cover all the warbands in here. So you're not going to get every single warband in this book. And that's where all the, the different books come into play and the supplements. But there's a good chance you're going to play one of these warbands anyway. So the information could be there. But let's look at the other books and the campaign quests that are going to be able to be played by any warband. I started playing Warcry in November 2020 and I picked up the Catacombs box set. So there's a good chance many people started there. And in the Catacombs book, you'll also find some campaign quests. And there's a whole campaign section there. And this section is mostly guided towards the Knight Shadow Stalkers. And so as they're included in the box set, you're going to get four campaign quests for the Knight Shadow Stalkers. And you're going to get two for the Scions of the Flame. So they've already got some in the original core book. So they've only done two for the Scions. But they've also included this section called Fated Quests. And this opens up quests to any warband. So for these ones, any warband from any alliance can play them. And in this book, you're going to get four. The first one's the Obsidian Tower, then the Spawn Master, the Orb of Secrets, and then this one takes you into the Catacombs and the Trail of Destruction, another Catacombs quest. So you'll notice that these are called Fated Quests, but they are just the same. They're still a campaign quest, but they're just calling them 
fated quests. And this is how they refer to them in all of the supplement books. So those are the quests you can choose from the Catacombs book. But now let's look at some other books. As I'll be using the Beasts of Chaos throughout this video series as the Warband as an example to show you how to set up the campaign and play it, I'm going to use the Agents of Chaos book and I'm going to choose one of the campaign quests from here. And you can see there's a whole section on campaign quests and again they're calling them fated quests but they're exactly the same. And um, with these it's going to give us another four. So we're going to get Crimson Bounty, we're going to get the Grand Plague of Vetch, we're going to get Fit for a King and we're going to get Beneath Shadowed Boughs. And these are going to include mostly the terrain from the above ground but you can see it's geared at the terrain from the Catacomb set. So those are the ones included in the Agents of Chaos book and any warband from the Alliance of Chaos can play those ones. If you don't play Chaos but you play, play Death, Destruction or Order then you'll find exactly the same setup in these books. So if we have a look in the contents page here we've got the fated quests for all the warbands in the Alliance of Death and on page 44 it's going to lay out Again, another four campaign quests or fated quests that you can play with any warband from the Alliance of Death. And you'll find exactly the same in the Harbingers of Destruction and the Sentinels of Order. So whichever warband you play, there's going to be a book and a supplement book with even more fated quests in for you. Another book you can look at is the Monsters and Mercenaries. And this is somewhat outdated now, especially with the Warcry supplement books for the different alliances but in here there is a section with fated quests and you're going to find four fated quests that again you can use for any warband so there's so much content here that you can use and this is covering some terrain from some of the expansion sets that came out so you can see there's lots there lots of content to choose from and that's the monsters and mercenary book we also have the Tome of Champions 2019 and again we have a section on Fated Quests but this time it's going to have 8 so there's going to be a lot more in there to play and this is going to include terrain from all different terrain sets from the original set, the Catacombs and some of the expansions so there's loads to go on in here and again with these 8 Fated Quests these are all going to be able to be played by any warband from any alliance. So that's the Tome of Champions 2019. Now we also have the Tome of Champions 2020. And again, this is going to give us eight fated quests that can be played by any warband from any of the alliances. And so we're going to get eight different ones with a nice selection of terrain from all the different sets. And this is the most recent one. And this includes some of the terrain and the boards from the Catacomb set. So you can include that there. So this is a nice one. And also some of the extra catacombs boards that you can buy separately. And again, these are all for any warbands. So that's the Tome of Champions 2020. And that's the final supplement book that contains the fated quests. On top of these fated quests, the Tome of Champions also has even more narrative play options. And this is all centered around Soroth Core, the Silent City. So this is a great book if you really want to delve into a really deep narrative. I mean, look at all the information they're giving you here. It's so packed with it here. And this is for a Soroth Core campaign. I'm not going to cover this in the series, but just be aware it exists. And if it's something you want to look into, then it's in here. And I'm sure I'll be covering this as we go forward throughout the year, going through as much of the campaigns and battles and different sections of the books as we can. So that's in there if you want to take a look, but we won't cover that in the series. So this is a, a lot of books here, and you, you really don't need all of these. I mean, I'm going to just take from the Agents of Chaos book, and then use the Core book and the Catacombs book. And uh, unless you wanted to play from different warbands, you certainly don't need those. You're going to get loads of information here. And each one of those fated quests or campaign quests is going to contain... 11 battles so even if you play one or two battles a week it's going to take you quite some time to finish the campaign and at each stage you may not pass the convergence so you may have to play that again so there's just so many weeks here of gameplay if you bought every one and wanted to play every single fated quest then you'll be playing for a long time so yeah there's a lot going on here but don't be overwhelmed i would just say stick with the core book 
and the catacombs and perhaps pick up one of the supplement books for the alliance that you like to play. Just flicking back to the core book, uh, you'll notice that it's mostly focused on those original warbands. And now if you buy just the warband set, you're not going to have many miniatures in there to take you up to 1400 points. So you're going to have to get some more. And these are really geared towards encouraging you to use the beasts and thralls in your warband to make up those points. Whereas when you start getting into the kind of Age of Sigmar, um, let's have a look, here we go, like the Night Haunt, then making 1400 points to them is going to be a lot easier because there's a lot more miniatures available. You can double up and get two sets or get the, uh, for say, for the Corvus Cabal, you could get the Age of Sigmar set that includes two of every miniature, but then you're going to have, you know, not too much variety. So if you want lots of variety with your fighters, I would say pick a warband from the original ones and then use the Chaotic Beasts or choose one of the Age of Sigmar ones and then you're going to get a lot more variety. Now if you choose one of the Age of Sigmar warbands that's not included in any of the fated quests here, then you're not really going to be able to play the ones from the core book. So just be aware of that when choosing your warband, especially when you're starting off. It would be better to use uh, some miniatures you already have perhaps. But if you did pick up the Catacomb set, you are going to get those four fated quests included that can be played with any warband whatsoever. So if you've got that set, then that opens up many more options to you. Now you've seen all the books that are available to you and all the fated quests that you can play, let's focus on the Agents of Chaos. And I've picked out one called Fit for a King. And this kind of fits in with uh, a good, good fated quest that I think would be fun for the Beasts of Chaos to play. So we'll just have a quick work through this to give you an overview. But as we go through the series, we're going to cover all the details in this fated quest in great detail. And we'll cover everything you need to know. But for now, just a quick overview, just to give you an idea of the layout and what it contains. You'll see here at the top that we get a rune mark. And this would usually be for a faction rune mark. But this one is for Chaos. So we know that any warband from the Alliance of Chaos can play this fated quest. And it starts off with a map and a brief introduction and overview just to let you know what the fated quest is all about and it's really cool how they can sum it up in just these two small paragraphs and let you know exactly what it contains and then along here it's got all the different points your battle and these are all the territories and the final second and first convergences and so you'll work your way through here getting all the way to the end and then once you've done those 12 battles and completed each one successfully then you will succeed in the campaign. Each fated quest will also have a table for the artifact of power and the command trait. And again, we're going to cover those in videos in the series. And then it gives you your first convergence, your second and your final. And for these convergence battles, it lays out your battle plan, your deployment, victory and twist. And you see it's got the terrain set up. So it tells you exactly how to set up. And you also get a little bit of narrative specific to that battle. So you get that for the first, second and final convergences. The final section in a fate quest is the campaign outcome. And if the warband is the winner and you complete the campaign quest, then you get to choose between honor and glory. Again, we'll cover this in detail, but when you choose honor or glory, there'll be two tables and this gives you the outcome and you can claim your reward. So if we just quickly flick to that, to give you an idea, you'll get two tables here and then you can choose your reward. And we'll go through exactly how that works as we play through the campaigns and go through all the rules. That brings us to the end part one of the narrative campaign series. And now we know how to embark on a campaign and choose our campaign quest. Come and join me for part two, where we'll go through a really fun part of the campaign process where we put together our warband and we'll go through the warband roster. We'll take a close look at each section of the warband roster and all the rules that apply to it. So this video is really going to cover the rules and I'll create a separate video where we go through the warband roster for my beasts of chaos and I'll show you exactly how I put together the warband and the roster for the beasts of chaos for the campaign I'm going to play. In part one, we covered how to choose a campaign quest. After choosing a campaign quest, 
you will need to fill out a warband roster. You can find this on page 160 of the core rulebook and you'll need to photocopy it or take an image on your phone or iPad and then complete it on that. The first step is to note down the name of the campaign quest you have chosen. Then fill in the other areas of player and warband information such as your warband's name. You can draw inspiration from the many warbands that are mentioned in the core book and also in the Warcry supplement books. I think it's a great idea for the name to reflect the background of your warband and I think just spending the time to write a few lines or a paragraph or two about their background and their motivations is a real great way to start the narrative and to start building your warband to give it character. You'll see how I do this in the video when we look at the Beasts of Chaos and create their Warcry warband roster. You'll see that the warband roster has space for one leader or a favoured warrior and 10 fighters. For a full 20 strong warband, you'll need two copies of this page. Now let's take a look at adding fighters. The next step in completing your warband roster is to add fighters to it. Your warband roster is the pool of fighters from which you'll pick up to 15 fighters when mustering your warband for a campaign battle. Before your first campaign battle, you can add up to 20 fighters to your warband roster. These fighters can total any number of points, but it should contain at least 1,000 points worth of fighters to allow you to field a full warband during your first campaign battle. You do not have to add the full 20 fighters to begin with. You can instead choose to add additional fighters as the campaign progresses. You'll be able to add and remove fighters from your warband roster after each campaign battle. When adding fighters to your warband roster, you must adhere to the following restrictions. Number one, your warband roster must include at least three fighters. Number two, your warband roster cannot exceed 20 fighters. Number three, all fighters added to your warband roster must share the same faction rune mark as the campaign quest you have chosen. And finally, number four, there can be only one fighter added to your warband roster with the leader rune mark. For point four, a recent errata has updated this and it now states that your warband roster must include one fighter with the leader rune mark and cannot include more than one fighter with the leader rune mark. With the introduction of the Warcry supplements book, such as the Agents of Chaos book, the rules around this have changed slightly. There are now rules for special types of fighters known as heroes and allies. These rules allow you to include more than one fighter with the leader rune mark in your warband, as well as fighters with a different faction rune mark to your warband. This gives you even more ways to theme your warband and make it unique. With these rules, any fighter with the same faction rune mark as your warband and the leader rune mark can be included in your warband as a hero. Any fighter with a different faction rune mark to your warband and either the leader rune mark or the ally rune mark can be included in your warband as an ally. However, warbands can only include allies from the same Grand Alliance. For example, Chaos warbands can only include allies with a Chaos Faction rune mark. In addition, fighters with a Chaotic Beasts Faction rune mark and the ally rune mark can be included as allies in Chaos warbands. There are limits on how many heroes and allies you can include in your warband, and so let's take a look at the specific details for narrative campaign play. In narrative play, heroes and allies can be added to your warband roster like any other fighter, either when you are first filling out your warband roster, 
or during the add and remove fighters step of the aftermath sequence. Your warband roster can include up to three heroes or allies in any combination. When adding fighters to your warband roster, heroes and allies are not considered to have the leader rune mark and do not count towards the maximum numbers of fighters you can add. When mustering for a campaign battle, you can include one hero or ally from your warband roster for every two areas of territory your warband has dominated. For example, if you have five areas of dominated territory, you can include up to two heroes or allies from your warband roster in your warband for that campaign battle. Heroes and allies cost points just like any other fighter, but allies are ignored for the purposes of the rule that requires all fighters in a warband to share the same faction rune mark. In addition, when mustering your warband, heroes and allies are not considered to have the leader rune mark. If your warband can include thralls when mustering for a campaign battle, any heroes or allies you include in your warband do not decrease the number of thralls you can include, and vice versa. Like other fighters, heroes and allies can receive destiny levels, players must make injury rolls for them, and they can bear lesser artefacts. Heroes can bear artefacts of power, and be chosen to become favoured warriors, but allies cannot. One other point to remember is that heroes and allies never lead. When a fighter is included in a warband as a hero or ally, if they have the leader rune mark on their fighter card, this rune mark is only used to determine which abilities the fighter can use. The hero or ally is not considered to have the leader rune mark for any other purpose or rule. This means that any rule that refers to the leader of a warband does not refer to any heroes or allies in that warband. There's quite a lot of information there to take into account when building a warband and later on in this series I'll create a video that deals specifically with heroes and allies and I'll use some examples with the Beasts of Chaos and show you what kind of fighters you can bring in for both heroes and for allies. For the purpose of this video, just bear in mind that those rules are in addition to the core rules and those updates are in place and you don't have to use them, you could just stick to the core book but if you do want to keep up to date and use those expansion books then those rules are there for you. Now we've covered how to add fighters to your warband roster, it's a good time to point out that on pages 134 to 151 of the core book, you can find background tables to help you personalise all the fighters in your warband. I won't cover those in this video, but we'll certainly cover them as we get on and use the Beasts of Chaos as our example warband. Um, but this is a great way to add to that narrative and to really personalise your fighters and your warband as a whole. So we'll come to that in a later video. Going back to our Warcry warband roster, let's take a look at the Campaign Progress Tracker. The warband roster includes a Campaign Progress Tracker. This tracks how close your warband is to completing the goal of their quest. There are 12 points on the campaign tracker referred to as map points. Your warband begins on the map point labelled start. You can indicate the progress of your warband by marking the map point they have reached. You can find the rules for advancing map points on page 70 and we'll cover that in a video further down the line in this series. Now let's look at preparing for your first campaign battle. When first filling out your warband roster, you can ignore the lesser artifacts, artifacts of power, command traits, destiny levels, territories, and glory point sections, as these only come into play after your first campaign battle. 
Regarding the artifacts and command traits, each fighter can be the bearer of one artifact of power and one lesser artifact. In addition, your leader can have one command trait. You'll also notice that we have a section on destiny levels. Each fighter can gain up to three destiny levels. If a fighter gains a destiny level, you can mark one of the icons to indicate so. During a campaign battle, if a fighter spends their destiny level, you can place a counter on it to indicate it is spent. There's also another section on territories. Your warband can dominate up to six pieces of territory at any one time. The campaign quest you have chosen will detail how your warband can dominate territory and what effect territory has on your warband. The final section to cover here with the warband roster is glory points. After a campaign, your warband will gain a number of glory points which can be spent during the aftermath sequence. And we'll cover the aftermath sequence in great detail. That covers the overview for the Warcry warband roster, but don't forget that we're going to go through and complete a warband roster together using the Beasts of Chaos as an example. And that video will feature once we've covered the rules in the core book. If you've got any questions at all as we go through this campaign rules series, then please add them in the comments below. It'd be great to hear your thoughts and feedback, and if I can help in any way, that'd be awesome. Come and join me for part three of our How to Play Warcry campaign series, where we'll go through playing a campaign battle, take a real close look at the convergences, decisive battles and spores of war, and delve a little deeper into the narrative that comes along with those convergences. In the previous parts of this series, we've looked at how to embark on a campaign, choose a campaign quest, and we've had an overview of the Warband roster. So now let's get started and look at playing a campaign battle. Once you have chosen your campaign quest and filled out your Warband roster, you are ready to start playing campaign battles against opponents. You can challenge any player to a campaign battle if they too have chosen a campaign quest and filled out a warband roster. Both players must agree to play in a campaign battle instead of a normal battle. As we talked about in part one, I'll be creating a separate video that goes into great detail about how to play a campaign solo, and that'll cover all aspects of choosing different warbands to fight against, and we'll just cover everything that you need to know to make a solo campaign successful. To play a campaign battle, players use the core rules for setting up a battle, which you can find on page 36 and 37 of the core book. And I've also created a separate video on this in the How to Play Warcry series that covers everything you need to know. It's important to note that for a campaign battle, there are just a couple of amendments that you'll need to make when setting up for battle. The first, when mustering a warband for the battle, all fighters chosen must be taken from your warband roster. Players may be able to muster more than 1,000 points of fighters if they have dominated territory or have spent glory points on reinforcements. We haven't covered glory points yet, but don't worry, we'll cover that as we go through the series. After playing the battle, both players must complete the aftermath sequence. And again, this will be covered later on. Now let's take a little look at convergences. Each campaign quest includes three unique campaign battles referred to as convergences. On the campaign progress tracker of your warband roster, there are three map points marked as the first convergence, the second convergence, and the final convergence. Each of these map points is referred to as a convergence map point and corresponds to a convergence on your campaign quest. When a player's warband is on a convergence map point, that warband must play the corresponding convergence and be victorious to advance further along the campaign progress tracker. The next time the player controlling that warband plays a campaign battle, 
they can ask their opponent if they would like to play through their convergence. Each convergence has unique rules to follow when generating the battle plan. If both players' warbands are on convergence map points, the players will have to decide which convergence they will play through. Only one player's warband can play through their convergence, even if both warbands are embarked upon the same campaign quest and have reached the same convergence map point. In a convergence battle, the warband whose convergence the players are playing through is referred to as the aspirant warband. Their opponents is referred to as the adversary warband. To play through the convergence, use the guidelines for campaign battles that we just covered, but generate the battle plan according to the corresponding convergence on the campaign quest. This means you might know some of the battle plan cards in play before you muster your warband, so use this knowledge to your advantage. Now let's look at decisive battles. If the aspirant warband loses the convergence, they must play through it again and win the battle before they can advance to the next map point on the campaign progress tracker. The next time the convergence is played through, it can be against the same opponent or a completely new opponent. The player controlling the adversary warband gets to make an additional search for lesser artefacts in the aftermath sequence of a convergence, and this is known as the spoils of war. And again, we'll cover this in future videos in the series. Now we'll look at the narrative of convergences. For the aspirant warband, a convergence represents a pivotal moment in their quest. Success or failure balances on the edge of a blade, with only the adversary warband standing between them and their goal. To build up the drama and tension of the battle to come, it is recommended that the player controlling the aspirant warband reads aloud the introductory narrative to the convergence and also tells the tale of the campaign quest their warband is embarked upon and the key events that have happened so far. For the player controlling the adversary warband, playing through the convergence offers not only a chance to earn some extra treasure through the spoils of war, but also lets you interact with the world of the eight points as the fighters of your warband take on a new role, such as becoming the hired swords of a chaos warlord or ambushes spring in a trap. For some players though, they might decide that they do not wish to take the role of the adversary warband because it does not suit the character of their warband. In such cases, it's fine to ask your opponent to find another player to play through the convergence with and to play a standard campaign battle instead. We've gone through quite a large part of the section on playing a campaign that comes in the Warcry core rulebook and now it's time to move on and look at the aftermath sequence. The aftermath sequence is quite a large part of the campaign process and there's a fair bit to go through so I'm going to break that down into a couple of videos and then we can go in great detail about each section that comes in that aftermath sequence and that's going to include how we can earn and spend glory points get some reinforcements, make injury rolls, roll for destiny levels, add and remove fighters, search for lesser artifacts and loads more. So the aftermath sequence is really fun and there's lots going on there. So we'll cover that in the next couple of videos. And um, yeah, that's going to be good fun to go through it all. And this is where the campaign really comes into its own. So come and join me for part four, where we'll start the aftermath sequence. We'll cover the first part of the aftermath sequence, which will cover mostly the fighters. We'll look at how to earn and spend glory points, make injury rolls, roll for destiny levels, add and remove fighters, and search for lesser artifacts. After each campaign battle has ended, both players must complete a series of steps referred to as the aftermath sequence. It's best for both players to do this immediately after the battle is finished as it is required that each player witnesses the aftermath sequence of the other. There are seven steps in the aftermath sequence and the steps must be completed in order and they go as follows. Number one, earn and spend glory points. Number two, 
Make injury rolls. Number three, roll for destiny levels. Number four, add and remove fighters. Number five, search for lesser artifacts. Number six, advance on the campaign progress tracker. And finally, number seven, earn artifacts of power or command traits. In this video, we'll cover steps one to five. And so let's get started with step one, where we earn and spend glory points. After playing a campaign battle, each player receives a number of glory points as described in the following table. These factors are all cumulative. This table has been taken from page 66 of the core rulebook and you can use that table or you can choose to use the table from the updated errata and that affects the number of glory points that are assigned to each of the different sections of the table. You'll notice that the order has changed slightly and that the number of points awarded has also changed. Instead of receiving five glory points for winning a battle, you receive two, but you do get three glory points for taking part in a campaign battle rather than the previous one glory point. So there are some benefits there. And so, yep, again, it's up to you which table you choose. If you want to just stay true to the core book, then stick to that. But if you want to use the updated errata, and that's going to help you once you start doing the other campaign quests in all the supplement books, then I would recommend going with the, er uh, the errata and playing with the updated glory points. So once you've played your campaign battle, players note down their total glory points on their warband roster. These glory points are kept from battle to battle during the campaign until spent. There are a few ways that players can spend their glory points during the campaign. These are dominating territory, reinforcements or an additional search role. Let's take a look at dominating territory first. Players can choose to spend glory points straight away to dominate an area of territory. Each campaign quest has its own territory rules which detail how to dominate territory. For example, many warbands aligned to chaos can raise monoliths with their glory points. You can also use your glory points for reinforcements. Players can choose to spend any of their glory points before picking their warband for a campaign battle if their warband has less dominated territory than their opponent. To do so, they choose to spend either one glory point or three glory points. If they spend one glory point, they can increase the number of points they have available to spend on fighters by 50. If they spend three glory points, they can increase the number of points they have available to spend on fighters by 100. A player cannot spend more than three glory points in this manner before a campaign battle. The final way to spend glory points is through additional search rolls. Players can choose to spend glory points in the search for lesser artifacts step. To do so, they can choose to spend three glory points to make an additional search roll upon the lesser artifacts table, which you can find on pages 68 and 69 of the core rulebook. A player cannot spend more than three glory points in this manner during that step. You may have noticed that when people talk about campaigns and warband rosters, they say that there's a maximum of 1400 points that you can play at any battle. I found this quite confusing because I couldn't find anywhere in the core rulebook that specified this number of points. So I thought this would be a cool time to go through and just explain where that 1400 points comes from. Generally, for each territory dominated by your warband, you increase the points you have available to spend on fighters when mustering your warband for a campaign battle by 50. So with potentially six territories to dominate, that's going to give you a total of up to 300 points that you can keep with you throughout the campaign. So that takes the total up to 1300, but that extra 100 can be brought into play by purchasing reinforcements. When you spend your glory points for reinforcements, you're going to increase your points for fighters by 50 or 100. 
These points only apply to the next campaign battle and don't carry over. So if you want to keep going at 1400 points, you have to use those glory points before each campaign battle and then increase it by 50 or 100 each time. So I hope that clears up where the 1400 points comes from. It took me a little while to figure that out, but hopefully that makes sense. Now we've covered how to earn and spend glory points, let's look at step number two where we make injury rolls. If a fighter from your warband was taken down in the battle, there is a chance the wounds received will be fatal and the fighter will die. You must make an injury roll for each fighter that was taken out in the battle. To do so, roll a 2d6 and consult the table. On a 2 to 3, that fighter is slain. On a 4 to 5, they have lost favour. On a 6 plus, they make a full recovery. If you roll the slain result for a fighter, you must remove that fighter from your warband roster. If that fighter has lesser artefacts or artefacts of power, these two are lost. This will free up a space on your warband roster to add a new fighter, and we'll cover that in a little while. Leaders are known as being destined for greatness. If you roll the slain result for a fighter with the leader rune mark, that fighter does not die. Instead, treat the result as lost favour. It's important to note here that if you're playing a hero or an ally, then the hero or ally is not considered to have the leader rune mark for any other purpose or rule, so that destined for greatness does not apply to them. If you roll the lost favour result for a fighter that has gained any destiny levels, they lose one of those destiny levels, otherwise it has no effect. If you roll a full recovery result for a fighter, they suffer no effects. Now let's move on to step 3 where we roll for destiny levels. As your warband grows in power, certain fighters will begin to carve their own legends and stand apart as destined by the gods for glory. After a campaign battle, you can make a destiny roll for each fighter from your warband that was not taken down during the battle. To do so, roll a dice and on the roll of a six, that fighter gains a destiny level. Mark it on your warband roster by colouring in a destiny level icon. A fighter can have up to three destiny levels at once. Each destiny level gives the following benefit in future campaign battles. This is called Favour of the Gods, and during a campaign battle, a player can choose to spend one of their fighter's destiny levels to re-roll one dice during an attack action made by that fighter. A spent destiny level replenishes at the end of the battle. Now we're on to step 4 where we look at adding and removing fighters. Players can choose to remove any fighters from their warband roster and add new fighters if there is space. This step uses the following rules. Any fighter except the leader can be removed from your warband roster. If you do so, any lesser artefacts or artefacts of power that fighter bears are lost. New fighters can be added to the warband roster. The limits on page 64 of the core rulebook still apply though when adding new fighters. And we covered these limits in part 2 of the series where we looked at completing the warband roster. Now we're on to step 5 where we search for lesser artefacts. There are many items of treasure that warbands may come to acquire. Some are much sought after treasures found in hidden vaults, locked away since the age of myth amidst the ruins circling the Varen Spire. Others are more common and can be bartered for and obtained in the dark streets of anarchic settlements. After a campaign battle, each player can make one search roll upon the lesser artefacts table and you can find this on page 68 and 69. When they make the search roll, they'll see if they obtain any lesser artefacts. To do so, roll two dice. The first dice indicates the tens roll, and the second indicates the units roll. 
This is also referred to as a D66. Then, once you've done that, look up the corresponding result on the table. If your warband obtains a lesser artifact, you must decide which one of the fighters in your warband will bear it. A fighter can bear no more than one lesser artifact at any time, but can bear both a lesser artifact and an artifact of power. Make a note on your warband roster of which fighter bears the lesser artifact. A lesser artifact can never be swapped from one fighter to another, but if you wish for a fighter who already bears a lesser artifact to bear another, you can discard any lesser artifacts they have to allow you to do so. Now let's take a look at how we can use lesser artifacts. Each lesser artifact has a description of how they work on the lesser artifacts table. The rules for a lesser artifact will often refer to the bearer. The bearer is the fighter that bears that lesser artifact. Some lesser artifacts are labelled as consumable. These give the bearer a one-use action they can make when activated. Once the action has been made, that lesser artifact is then removed from your warband roster. Other lesser artifacts are labelled as perishable. These lesser artifacts have rules which are always in play. This means they do not require an action to trigger their effect. However, at the end of a campaign battle, you must roll a dice for each perishable lesser artifact borne by a fighter from your warband that took part in that battle. On a 4+, the lesser artifact retains its power and can remain on your warband roster. On a 1-3, to three, the lesser artifact has lost its power, so remove it from your warband roster. Here you can see the two lesser artifacts tables that you can find on page 68 and 69 of the core rulebook and you can see they're packed with some really fun and cool lesser artifacts that are both perishable and consumable. There's been a great update in the most recent errata and it says here that for the lesser artifacts we should change the first sentence of all consumable lesser artifacts to read as follows. Consumable. The bearer can use this lesser artifact as a bonus action. This is a brilliant update because now instead of using one of our actions in our activation to make use of a consumable lesser artifact, now it's a bonus action. That's now taken us through the first part of this aftermath sequence where we've gone through steps one through five. And now so come and join me for the next part in this series where we'll look at how to advance on the campaign progress tracker earn artifacts of power or command traits and we'll also take a look at what happens when you complete a campaign quest and how to choose a new one. We'll look at how to advance on the campaign progress tracker, we'll look at how to earn artifacts of power and command traits and then finally we'll look at completing the campaign quest and choosing a new campaign quest. Let's start with how to advance on the campaign progress tracker. After each campaign battle, both players can advance their warband on their campaign progress tracker one map point closer to the map point labelled Campaign Goal. The exception to this is if a player's warband is currently on a convergence map point. In this case, the player's warband can only advance if they played the corresponding convergence as the aspirant warband and won the battle. Now we know how to advance, let's look at earning artifacts of power and command traits. After advancing your warband on the campaign progress tracker, if it has moved onto a map point marked artifact of power or command trait, you will receive one of these and we'll go through exactly what that means now. Let's start with the artifacts of power. When you receive an artifact of power, Pick one from the Artifact of Power table on your campaign quest. Alternatively, you can roll a d3 to determine which Artifact of Power you receive. Artifacts of Power follow many of the same rules as the lesser artifacts which we covered in the previous video. First, 
you must decide which fighter in your warband will bear it. A fighter can bear no more than one artifact of power at any time, but they can bear both an artifact of power and a lesser artifact. Make a note on your warband roster of which fighter bears the artifact of power. If the fighter you wish to bear the artifact of power already bears another, you can first give the old artifact of power to a fighter who bears none, and then give the first fighter the new artifact of power. This is the only time an artifact of power can be swapped from one fighter to another. Each artifact of power has a description of how it works on the artifact of power table on each campaign quest. The rules for artifacts of power will often refer to the bearer. The bearer is the fighter that bears that artifact of power. Unlike lesser artifacts, artifacts of power are not labelled as consumable or perishable. An artifact of power instead provides a permanent benefit to the fighter that bears it. Now let's take a look at command traits. When you receive a command trait, pick one from the command trait table on your campaign quest. Alternatively, you can roll a d3 to determine which command trait you receive. A command trait is an additional bonus given to your leader. Each command trait has a description of how it works on the command trait table on each campaign quest. Each provides a permanent benefit to the fighter. A leader can only have one command trait. If you receive another, for example, if you move on to a new campaign quest after completing your first, you can choose one of the other fighters in your warband to become a favoured warrior, and we'll cover that next. As your warband grows in power, some fighters will stand apart from their peers, having earned the favour of their leader through glorious feats in battle. If your warband receives a command trait, but your leader already has one, you can at that point nominate one of the other fighters in your warband to become the favoured warrior. This fighter receives the command trait instead of your leader in the same manner a leader would, and we covered that just now. A warband can only have one favoured warrior, so any further command traits gained are discarded. However, if the favoured warrior has been slain or removed from the warband when a new command trait is gained, you can nominate a new fighter to be the favoured warrior and give them that command trait. When you nominate a fighter to become the favoured warrior, it can be fun to roll on the leader or favoured warrior background table in the background table section, which you can find on page 134 to 151. And then you can see how that character has developed. But I would say that having a background for all your characters before you get to that st stage is even more fun. And I would definitely recommend improving your narrative by doing that. Now that's all covered, let's take a look at completing a campaign quest. When your warband advances onto the map point marked as the campaign goal, your warband is said to have completed its quest. On the campaign quest, you will find a page reference that will lead you to both the narrative outcome of your quest and your reward, and this reward will be a mighty artifact of power. A warband that has completed its campaign quest can continue to play campaign battles, but will no longer advance a map point during the aftermath sequence. So it's at this stage you can then choose a new campaign quest. Once they have completed their campaign quest, some warbands choose to remain and exert dominance over the territories they have conquered. For others, the call of their gods, the allure of fresh challenges and the promise of further artifacts of power leads them to leave behind their territories as they embark on a new quest. If you have completed your campaign quest, you can choose to start a new campaign quest with the same warband roster. To do so, there are three steps you'll need to follow. Number one, choose a new campaign quest with a faction room mark 
that matches the one on your Warband roster. Note down the new campaign quest on your Warband roster. Step 2. Remove all dominated territories and glory points from your Warband roster. And Step 3. Move your Warband back to the map point labelled Start on the Campaign Progress Tracker. Once a campaign quest has been completed, the same campaign quest cannot be started again by the same warband. And now we've come to the end of all the rules we need to start and complete a campaign quest. But that's not the end of this how to play a Warcry campaign series and in the following videos I'll take the Beasts of Chaos and together we'll go through every element of the campaign process. We'll choose a campaign quest and together we'll go through the Warband roster, completing all the information for all the different fighters. And then as we play through the different battles, I'll put up some battle reports so you can see it in action. And then we'll go through the aftermath sequence and every other element of the campaign. If you're looking at playing a campaign with your miniatures and putting a Warband together, then this is the perfect time for you to do it. It'd be so cool for you to start your campaign at the same time as me and then we can work through it together and then we can share all our progress on the different social media platforms like on Instagram, Reddit and if you join the Patreon page that's the place to come where we can really get in depth and share all our hobby progress and ideas. If you've got any questions at this point, please add them in the comment sections below. It'd be great to hear your thoughts and feedback too. And if I can help in any way, that would be awesome. Thanks for watching. I really hope this video was helpful. You can find the next episode in the series at the end of this video and also a link to the playlist where you can go right through from part one right through to the end and find out everything you need to know to play a Warcry narrative campaign. I'll put links in the description below to all the things we've used during this series and links to the Catacomb set, the different warbands we've used, the dice and the card sets. There'll be affiliate links to Element Games, but they won't cost you anything extra. In fact, they could save you up to 20% and for every sale made through an affiliate link, I get a small commission and that's going to help me develop the channel. So thanks so much for that support. I really appreciate it. If you like the channel and the content I put out and would like to support it further, please take a look at my Patreon page. It's a really great community where we meet on Discord to share our hobby, join in with different conversations around different aspects of the game and a great place to hang out. You can also find perks on there that you're just not going to get anywhere else. And it'd be awesome to see you there on Patreon. And I'll put the link in the description below. Thanks so much for watching. Please like if you like it, subscribe for more videos like this. And don't forget to hit the notification bell to join me next time on Tabletop Skirmish Games.